Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Autografool. We've come here to the hills just outside of Lake Tegensee in Bavaria to show you this, the facelift of the A8. This one is the hybrid model. So we're going to take a much closer look when we get into everything that the drive delivers. But before then, we're going to take a little closer look and see what's changed with the facelift. Along with brand new bumpers, we're also sporting a brand new grille design and some very clever trick visual geometry is going on here. What Audi have done with this edition is they've raised the visual line and they've done that by pulling out the corners of this central grille. Now that line, that design line carries right through into these new headlights. New with this edition, the daytime running lights have gone to the top of the headlights. That again helps to push the visual presence of the car slightly higher up. Lower down, we have this nice cut into the design, which still enhances the dynamic appearance of the car overall. So, a little bit of visual trickery happening at the front of this car. It works for me. What do you think? Five meters 30 or 209 inches, as you can see what we're driving here is the long wheelbase edition. Now that's not going to be available in all markets or in all configurations. So it's important that you check before you draw your heart to one particular model. Obviously being an executive car, the idea of the longer wheelbase here is that there's much more space in the rear and of course much more space in the far back for all of your luggage. Now, traditionally that would make this car somewhat more challenging to drive around the roads that you can imagine behind me, but not so on this model because we have rear axle driving as well as the front. And contrary to what you may think, those rear wheels can turn the opposite way not to each other, the opposite way to the front wheels, and that allows you to have a much smaller turning circle than you might expect for this car. New with the facelift, there are four new colors and there are five new matte colors available for this car. As you can see, we've done quite a good job with the weather conditions of putting salt all over the front of ours, but also worth pointing out, there are lots of new wheel designs. Now the wheels can come anywhere from 18 to 21 inches, but if you have winter tires as we have right here, the biggest you can get is going to be 20. Round at the back, more visual trickery, and I'd love to tell you this was a special dynamic paint effect, but just in case the camera isn't really doing this justice, this is just from the road conditions that we've driven through. But the unifying feature here is this light strip, which Audi are calling organic lighting. The reason for that is that it's dynamic. There are things like greeting signatures. There are also different profiles for driving profiles and it's even dynamic so that as you approach the car, it changes. But if you want a lot more detail on the lighting, check out Thomas's review of the A8. He does a night drive and he takes a really deep dive into how this lighting has changed. What you need to know is that this again draws your visual presence higher up the car, giving it more status and presence on the road. So not a radical change back here, but just a bit more bulk and a bit more presence. Overall, tying the entire car together visually. I think it gives it quite a, how shall I put it, robust statement on the road. I like it. What do you think? Now let's take a look inside. Well, obviously the A8 being a luxury car, you expect a few bells and whistles. Not least of those is that thanks to the air suspension, the car rises up in order to greet you when you open the door and then obviously lowers back down when you're ready to drive off. That's not the only neat tip. These seats, as you might expect, when you're trying to get in and out of the car, move backwards to make more space for you. And the moment you turn the car on, they move you straight into driving position. It's a small thing, but it's a very nice touch and it's very nicely executed on this car. So what happens as soon as you sit within the driving area? Well, I think the first thing that's worth mentioning is just how svelte everything is. Obviously, with the advent of digital technology, everything is screen, screens, and more screens, and it's very hard to work out how best to integrate those into design without totally dominating the landscape of the cockpit. Here, as you can see, the attempt has been in to mat those into the finish, so you really don't see them at all while the car is dormant. Switch the car on, there's that seat motion, motion, motion I was talking about, and everything comes to life. So regular viewers will know that I'm still a fan of those old analog knobs, buttons, and switches. Well, Audi have done enough to keep me relatively happy. Thank you, Audi, for leaving the steering wheel alone 
and we still have a good old fashioned volume knob down here. But for the rest, well, especially where climate control is concerned, you're gonna be spending an awful lot more time getting to know this system and how it functions. Fortunately, it's designed to be very easy to use without looking at it. So although yes, you're familiar with these plodding up and down actions here, you can also say, I'm not interested in doing that and just literally swipe to get where you want. There's also a rather nifty two finger function, which will allow you to change both of these at the same time. So if one of those is different to the other, if I do this, it automatically brings them to the same temperature that the drivers is set to. And that's great if you get into the car after somebody else has been using it and you just want to get back to where you were without messing around. Now, I don't wanna say huge amounts about the seats because if you didn't already see it, Thomas has gone into lots of effort to look into these in great detail. What I can tell you is if you can think of anything that you think a seat ought to be doing to you, these seats do it. Obviously, um, they have massage, heating, cooling, adjustments in almost every respect you can think of. What do you need to know? They're very, very comfortable. And don't just take my word for it. Please try them out for yourself. They really are everything you would expect from a modern seat and then a bit more as well. They put you right where you want to be down into the car, but also at the same time, you feel completely supported and at ease. So if you have back problems, and I have to say some of us older guys do develop those, you're going to be able to find something that you can adjust on this chair that hopefully will bring you a little relief and make driving that bit nicer. Now, if you're of a certain vintage, and I already indicated I am, you will remember Star Trek playing quite an important part in your childhood. What on earth does that have to do with this, you might wonder? Well, there's a little bit of me that thinks car design has an awful lot to do with giving boys who grew up into men the ability to believe that they're piloting the Starship Enterprise. And this car encapsulates that almost better than any other I've sat in so far. I think the trick is to make you feel like a Starfleet captain whilst obviously not messing with the way that the car behaves. In this car, that starts right up here at this roof liner, which is an Alcantara finish, and looks as if it's been vacuum formed straight into the roof. It's very round, it's very tactile, it's very ergonomic. We have oceans of tech, but look how nicely it's been integrated in the design. Watch this, for example. If I get you to have a look at the dashboard, if I switch on the climate control, and there you are. Look how nicely that's executed. If I switch it off again, here we go. It disappears like magic. That's poetry in motion, that is. And everything in this car has been executed to that level. Now you can call that overkill too much, but I really appreciate it. It keeps the design slick, and straightforward. Everything in this car is nicely finished. All of the surfaces you can touch are high quality materials. Look at this wood inlay down here, for example, and the way that matches into the tunnel just underneath it. It's just really nicely finished. It looks great, it feels great, and most important of all, it performs the job that it needs to do without you needing to get bothered by it. So, two thumbs up for me by that one. Let's take a look in the back and see what's happening there. As a luxury business saloon, the rear seat is everything. And this one does not disappoint. Now, there are lots of fancy tricks back here to show you properly. I'm gonna to need to take my shoes off. And I haven't seen this before executed on a car. So bear with me while we really get luxurious back here. So I don't know if you've been in a Mercedes S-Class, but that also has a function whereby you can move the front seat, but it takes an awful lot longer than this does. Now, I'm assuming if you're the kind of person who regularly travels back here, you're gonna have somebody who does this kind of thing for you before you get in. But that's really quite gratifying. If you wanted to feel you were in a real life Thunderbird type situation, you can't do a lot better than that, can you? Now. Again, regular viewers will remember I have short legs. So quite astonishingly, <laughs> look at that. I can't even reach the massage pads in the back of that chair. That's hilarious. 
Thomas was actually fully stretched out in this thing, luxuriating with his feet. But as you can see, my tiny, tiny legs literally don't, don't get anywhere near whatsoever unless I fully go the whole distance. All of which is to say, unless you have truly enormous legs, you are going to have more than enough space back here. Now, in case you think, that this is extraordinary overkill for anyone and they simply, nobody would need this. I really want to show you this. Before we get into looking at the central console in more detail, you can see that embedded in the central section are what you can really only describe as, I guess, upper class airline trays. Would that be a fair description? Could be, if I can figure out how, there we go. They slide over, push that back down now. If you just imagine sitting back here and you have a three hour drive, the amount of work that you could get done with that time, then suddenly none of this seems like overkill. This is a very comfortable environment. And although for the vast majority of people, that is beyond anything they could ordinarily want, when you combine this with the air suspension, the excellent lack of noise from the cabin, the total way in which the compartment is finished, for nothing but comfort and relaxation, then you really could lose yourself quite successfully in whatever it is you're doing and arrive at your destination having achieved a lot. And if you've ever tried to do work in the back of say a polo while you're traveling for three hours on a laptop, and I have, I can tell you it's a very different experience. So overkill for some, massively highly functional and useful for others. Obviously, if I had the chance, this would be how I would travel in the back of a car. But I don't think it's going to accommodate my three children and a dog in quite this degree of comfort. So once we've got ourselves situated, we've admitted that we can't fully utilize the seats as we've got two short legs. What have we got back here in the way of entertainment? Well, you can see we have a full screen which offers us the capacity to completely adjust lighting, the seats, and everything, no, nope. I was just sneakily wondering if I could get my feet a bit closer to that. I don't think that's gonna be possible for now. Um, that's as far forwards as the seat goes, but as you can see, there are lots of different options available for me here to make this even more comfortable. Again, the delivery is very much sophisticated and understated, so you really don't have to get too engaged with anything bothering you that you don't want two USB-C charging points and inductive charging pad back here as well. In short, in sum, I think that everything here is every bit as sophisticated as the experience in the front of this car. So you're not going to sit back here feeling like you're missing out on anything. I'm comfortable, I'm ready for a drive. What do you think, should we skip the plane and just drive back? Sure. Let's do it. Let's take a look and see what the hybrid setup's done to the engine bay. Ah, gas struts, just what you need. Well, what you're looking at is a three liter V6 TFSI and that produces 340 horsepower, but combined with the electric motor, you get an output of 462 horsepower. That is two horsepower more than the four liter V8. That'll give you zero to 100 in 4.9 seconds, which is 0.4 of a second slower than the four liter V8. Now, if you're interested in the charging information, 17.9 kilowatt hours is the size of the lithium ion battery. That will give you 59 kilometers of purely electric range. It'll take you about 150 minutes to charge if you've got a seven and a half kilowatt charger. If you just, however, wanna plug it into a regular socket, it should do the full charge in around about 495 minutes at 2.3 kilowatts. So that might sound like an awfully long time, but one of the very nice things about hybrids is that you can plug them in anywhere. And if you're going somewhere overnight, it does just give you that peace of mind that come the morning, you will have a fully charged car. This car comes in at 2,300 kilograms. To give you an idea, that's about 300 kilograms more than the standard model, so about 15% for the batteries and the electric motor. So, a little bit of a difference, 
Does it make any difference to the drive whatsoever? Well, I think that you would probably agree with me if I said that the best word to describe the driving experience of the A8 is refinement. Because of that, you have air suspension and everything in this car designed to make sure that you have as little disruption to your daily life as is humanly possible. That means that weight has never been a priority when building top-end luxury cars. Power and ease of use has always been the way to go. And because of that, additional weight doesn't have a major impact on the drive, you would hope. But physics are still physics. What I can tell you is that rather satisfyingly, the output of this car is two horsepower, count them, more powerful than its standard four liter V8 brother. So 462 horsepower combined system output. But of course, with all that extra weight, you are gonna have an impact on acceleration. So whereas you can get a lot more, I would say, out of the standard A8, you're gonna be costing yourself 0.4 of a second in terms of its zero to 100 kilometers acceleration. 0.4 of a second. Is that enough to cause you any dramatic distress? Well, I don't think it's gonna affect me that much. And what I can tell you is that thanks to the air suspension in this car, you're really not going to notice that weight in terms of the drive. Well, today we've come just outside of Bavaria to experience a little bit of snow in keeping with the Winter Olympics and an opportunity to try out the hybrid of the A8 to see how it compares with the regular version. If you haven't already seen it, I really encourage you to watch Thomas's review of that, especially the nighttime driving. So, at the moment, as you can tell, we are only gently cruising. And I know that thanks to the very, very good head-up display that Audi have fitted to this car. Head-up displays do tend to be a bit of a mixed bag because the angle of the windshield has such an extraordinarily large impact on the way in which the data can be displayed. It gets better and better year by year, and here it's particularly well delivered. So you get the standard information about speed, route, and also driver assistance systems. But obviously, as with all of the displays in this car, that can be adapted. Now, the first thing I wanna tell you about this car is not going to surprise you at all, and that's the comfort of the seat. If there's one thing I think it's imperative to get right in a luxury model, it's the seats. If you don't sit in one of these cars and feel that you are having an almost unique experience versus what you would expect from a lower model, then they've missed the trick. And these seats are something else but not only because they're incredibly comfortable, but they're also very easy to adjust. As you'd expect, there are about 400 different things I can do to the chair to make it fit me better. And ordinarily that can mean anywhere up to an hour of messing around with it while I'm doing an initial drive in a car just to get it right. Well, in this car, that was actually very quick indeed. And I can tell you that I not only have plenty enough support, this is not the sport seat, but thanks to this raised armrest that I have right here and the really comfortable armrest on the door, I really feel that my position is good. What's so great about that is that they didn't have to compromise on the comfort of the seat in order to still make me feel that I was held in place. Now, I'm not the smallest guy in the world, but I'm imagining that by a large extent, the target customer for this vehicle is going to be, okay, please, don't go too crazy if I'm wrong, an older guy. Why? Because it's not a cheap car and the target customer is probably, you know what, if you say A8 to, A8 to a lot of people, they're going to have in their brain a sales director of a company. Now, sadly for the moment, that tends to be older men, that is changing, but because of that, I still pick up a lot of cues in here telling me that that's what this car has been designed around. It's comfortable, but sporty at the same time. The balance is nice. Yes, I have the refinement that I expect from a luxury vehicle, but I also have a dynamic driving experience. Steering wheel, a little larger than you might expect, so it really feels solid underneath your hands. Obviously, that's good. It only serves to reinforce the feeling of quality that you get right throughout the vehicle. Now, the next interesting and notable thing about this is the long discussed and debated integration of digital display screens. Why? Well, you may remember, and I think it's fair to say, Mercedes were the first party in saying we can do this bigger and more impressively than anyone else. 
Since then, I think we've evolved and maybe even grown up a little bit. So all of the manufacturers are still trying to work out the best way of integrating technology into a vehicle without it being overwhelming, but still making it impressive and still most important of all, serving the purpose of having the tech in the car in the first place. Audi have gone the route of splitting this up into three distinct units. So obviously a fully digital driver's display, an infotainment system display, and then underneath you have the full uh, control suite, which predominantly you will be interacting with for heating and cooling. So how is that working on a standard driving experience? Well, you know what? I'm slightly torn here because on one hand, visually, and from the perspective of somebody actually owning this car, I'm really grateful for it having been shoved down the dashboard. That really makes for a much less disruptive driving experience. It doesn't take up huge acres of design language either, so you can still keep those lines crisp and clean. Now, talking of things that are focused and as they are supposed to be, have to mention these physical controls on the steering wheel. Thank goodness we're not still going with capacitive. It's much more satisfying to punch down on those controls. Now I get it, because of my age and my profile, I'm going to have to get over the fact that the heating and cooling controls are just not going to be dials and buttons anymore that I like. But they are better recognized in this car digitally, so although you still have to interact with the screen, my sense is that once you've owned this car for even a couple of weeks, you will find that quite natural. The placement is good of this second screen, and I can control those without too much need to refer to them. That's really helpful. But there are a couple of oddities here. I always think that one of the best things that you want access to to get the most out of your car is the mode selector. And here, that's one of these interesting haptic feedback buttons set just below the lower screen. Now, that's not a very natural experience. It doesn't feel entirely comfortable to switch between your driving modes. So if something that you like to do is to change depending on your environment, you're going to find that takes a little bit of adjusting to. That said, one of the driving modes is auto, where the car itself will change how it's interacting with your driving. And I think that's going to be more than enough. As with every other modern car, if you punch down, the power's already there for you. Beyond that, everything about this drive is so effortless, you just don't really want to concern yourself with it anyway. Now, usually a standard criticism of luxury vehicles is that you're gonna pay the price for that extra weight in the way that the car handles. Audi have done a lot to address that issue by providing rear wheel steering as well. That means even if you're going with a longer wheelbase model, which this car is, you're not going to feel that size and that weight nearly as much. The car is really very forgiving of even less than ideal handling and thanks to the decision to go with that air suspension you even have predictive suspension what does that mean in the real world speed bumps that's what it means now i remember the first time i ever drove a car that handled those well it would have been about a 1990s bmw 5 series and back then all of the campaign was about e equal weight distribution and how this made an epic difference to your drive I was never quite convinced until I took one through the streets of London and messed around with some of the myriad speed bumps that you can find there. And that was when I really realized just what was possible. But obviously there are prices to pay for having that kind of suspension built into a car. It was too heavy, the handling wasn't great. There were all kinds of problems when it came to servicing. And because of that, simple is generally agreed to be better in the world of most car design. But when you get up to the luxury cars, they say, you know what, 10 years down the road, that's gonna be somebody else's problem, not yours. So for now, let's just concern ourselves with the best technological solutions that we can deliver within the car. And that's always going to be air suspension. My only caveat to air suspension is always who's paying for the servicing of it but I'm assuming most people buying this car are gonna be doing it through their company or through the company they work for, maybe as a lease. Who cares? Just enjoy it. Now, talking about paying for this car through leasing, it's also well worth mentioning that the hybrid doesn't actually come at a radically higher cost. Yes, it isn't the same price. 
If you want to be looking at the 4-litre V8 that Thomas tested, you're going to be spending, in most markets, around about 9% less than the hybrid. But, and here is the big important point, the standard fuel economy on one of the regular petrol engine A8 is going to run you around about 10 litres for every 100 kilometres driven. The quoted figure, and I'm very cautious to state quoted figure, for this car is between 2.2 and two and a half liters combined. Now, if you wanna sit down with a pen and a bit of paper and work out on the back of an envelope, that does mean it's gonna take you a bit of time to pay for the additional expense, but you will get there. You will recoup your cost. And on top of that, you do get to know that you are owning a very high performing car that is much, much less polluting than its more powerful natural brothers. So what would I go for if I had the pick? Well, you know what, in the modern world, especially if you're gonna buy a bigger, more powerful car, I think there's an awful lot to be said for a hybrid. This guy can do a range of about 59 kilometers on pure electric alone. And that's really nice because if you're dropping off the kids at school in the morning, then you don't even have to think about it. But obviously there's no range anxiety because of that petrol engine. So you really do have the best of both worlds. Sometimes, I must admit, I struggle a little bit to understand quite what the value of all hybrids is. But in this car, to me, it makes perfect sense. The car is already heavy, so it doesn't really matter that you're adding all the extra weight of the batteries and the electric motor. I would say that by comparison to overall weight, that's a really good exchange. And you absolutely get the best of both worlds. No range anxiety, really good fuel efficiency, and still more than enough power for most people. Now, I stress the most people because the driving refinement here is excellent. But clearly, if what you want is real power and the thrill of owning a beast, this is not quite gonna do it for you. But if what you want is refinement and more than enough power for the vast majority of people, while you still get to feel good about owning and driving this car, you know what? I think it's a good sell, and I think I could be persuaded. I haven't done the numbers on the back of an envelope, but I actually don't think it would take too long to pay off that difference. And you know what? I think I'm actually gonna feel pretty good about it. Quick word on visibility. Again, it's important to note that this is entirely dependent on your stature and how you sit within the vehicle. I think the mirrors do an excellent job, which is good, as is often the case in luxury cars. When you do swing your head over the shoulder, there's an awful lot of everything in the way. The B-pillar, the headrest, there's not huge amount of ability to see into that blind spot area. But I will say this, of the many cars I've tested, this has one of the most pleasing side collision warning systems that I've experienced. The light is just right. It's bright enough that you absolutely know that there is something that you need to be aware of, but it's not so bright that it really distracts you from your drive. So it delivers the information you need effortlessly, which I think is a good way of describing how everything in this car interacts. First Audi I ever drove was an A4. And the thing I liked about that car more than anything else was just that it told me that everything about the way it was designed was to give you the best driving experience possible wasn't the most comfortable car I'd ever sat in. It didn't have the best display or the best aesthetic. But my goodness, when you started driving it, you really understood that the engineers had had the last say on how the car was put together. I couldn't be happier to report that in 2022, the A8 still drives exactly that way. Everything about this car is focused on the experience of the drive. Now, that includes the really intriguing compromise between the experience of the front seat passenger and the rear seat passenger. Why intriguing? Well, this car is a real challenge. For a lot of cars, for some markets, you say, okay, we have a brand differentiator. We have a different model for people who wanna travel in the back. Because for people who have a driver, well, with the best will in the world, they don't need for the driver to be blown away by the car. What they want is a very comfortable rear seat experience. The A8 is a very interesting challenge specifically because it's a car that's as likely to be experienced in the front as the back. 
an owner of one of these is not just going to be happy being driven around in it everywhere, they're gonna to want to experience the fun as well. So you gotta put just as much work and effort into how things are back there as how things are up here. And that's beautifully delivered. The backseat driving experience is fantastic. Clearly, it would have to be. The air suspension is largely responsible, but obviously also the breakdown of the tech from front to back is really nicely delivered. But, and this is a really big and important but, that doesn't come at the cost of the driver's experience. I can tell you that once you start driving this car, I could care less about the guy back there. Well, that's given you just a brief look at the A8 Hybrid. If you want more details, then please don't forget to check out Thomas's full review of the A8. We are gonna get out of here before the light goes, but we're getting ready for our test of the S8 tomorrow. So if you're keen in big beasts, then be sure and watch that review too.